everyone and welcome to my channel. My name is Caroline. I am a physics lecturer based here in the UK. I put up a new video every Monday and Thursday um, all about being a lecturer, working at a UK university, things that are happening in the student semester, the student calendar. Um, and obviously I'm a physics lecturer, so many of my videos might have a science related theme to them. But this video, I thought we could chat all about how academics actually kind of get paid, how we finance our travel to go to conferences, um, how we pay for our students to be able to do research, just kind of how it works, because it's a bit different being an academic scientist to being an, a researcher or a scientist in industry. So when I was working in industry, I applied for my job with the company, and then when the company took me on, we had an agreed salary, so amount I was going to get each year, and then obviously it's broken down into chunks, and then I get a certain amount paid to me each month. And then if I needed to travel, so say I needed to go to a conference or run an experiment or go to a meeting, then the company would pay for that and I'd either get paid up front for it, or if I had to pay for it, I'd be able to claim back my travel expenses. And it's great, you know, it's a great system. Um, in my case, I was so lucky. I got to travel a lot, go to a lot of different laboratories, see a different, lot of different places, go to conferences in some really nice locations. Um, so that was fantastic. And then when I joined academia, so when I joined my university here in the UK, there's some similarities, but there's also a few differences. So the first thing is when I'm at academia, which is where I am now, I still get a monthly paycheck, which is really good. Um, so the university still put a certain agreed amount into my bank account each month. Um, but there is a slight difference here in the fact that the university might pay me directly, but somebody else might be in part financing the position as well. So sometimes you'll find an industry sponsor will pay a certain amount towards the lectureship position. Um, sometimes you might find that somebody's won a research grant, they've won a research fellowship, and part of that money is uh, designated to pay for part of the lectureship position. So what can happen is that the university receives money from a third party for a period of months or years, and that money is then tagged to a particular lecturer who helps pay for their lecturer position. But in any case, you know, typically you're going to have some form of contract with the university and ultimately from my perspective, the university is paying me for each month's work. Then you come on to the travel. So again, travel is a little bit different. So I still need to go to conferences, to meetings. Um, I still run experiments in different locations and all of that is going to require some kind of travel cost. Uh, the main difference here is that when I was in my company, the company would automatically cover that cost. You know, they would pay for any travel that I needed to undertake. In academia, I need to finance that travel in part myself, perhaps, or I have to write a bid or a case in order to access the departmental fund. So typically what we will do as lecturers is we'll apply for something called a research grant. What are you doing? I'm recording. You can't come in the shot. So, down. You gotta go down, I'm gonna record. I'm recording, Bear. So typically here in the UK, I will apply for things called research grants. Your tail was in my shot. Typically then in the UK, I'm going to be applying for research grants. Um, and that is when I put in a bid and the bid is trying to win money, um, most likely from some research society, research council or organisation. And when I write that bid, I factor into it the cost for travel to conferences and meetings, the cost to run experiments and any costs incurred for other researchers working on the project. And those other researchers might be postdoctoral researchers. So they are people who've completed their PhD and they're now undertaking a, a period of time of doing solid research work. Or I might be putting some money towards a PhD student. And so I'm looking for part of that money from the research grant to support the PhD student, to pay for their bench fees. So the amount of money we paid to the university to have the student with us and to pay for their travel and to pay for their student stipend, we call it. And that's the money that, that's given to a PhD student, basically, so they can pay for some housing, so they can afford to eat, so they can keep themselves warm, and their day-to-day -day living costs. So all of that is kind of bundled into these things we call research grants. And so as a lecturer, they are a key way that I need to finance my ongoing research, ongoing studies, and the research and studies of those connected to my own work in my research group. 
Um, but there's also a, a kind of complementary system. And so most universities are going to have put aside some money each year. And that's like a central pot of money. And then I'm able to bid into that so I can write a bid to the university and say, actually, I want to go to this conference. Um, please, can I have some money to attend? And quite often, um, the university like you to have some money coming in from another source as well as the money from the university. So they like you to have, say, half the money given to you by the university and maybe half the money coming from your research grant or half the money coming from your industry sponsor. So travel is slightly different. You know, I have to finance my travel in a different way. And it means that sometimes you have to be quite careful and thoughtful about actually where you want to go. You know, it's not like there's an infinite pot of money and I can go everywhere. I have to plan up my conferences. I have to make sure that my students are getting to go to the events that they need to go to. Um, but then actually as a student, so the PhD students, they also can put in bids. So they're able to apply to some pots of money at the university to support their travel. And so typically, again, what happens is we'll finance student travel, both from the research grant that's linked to that student, and sometimes we'll support it from money from the actual university. And even better, sometimes the actual conference or the meeting will have money marked aside for students. And so sometimes the student can apply directly to the conference, and that means they'll get some money to support their travel as well. So there's various things we can do, but as you can see, it's a bit of a complicated picture. It's not like I go to one bucket of money and I get everything I need to go to one particular conference or meeting. Sometimes I have to piece money together from different locations in order to get myself there and my students there. But actually, you know, it's, I think it's an it's a interesting part of the job. Um, it makes you really value your travel. You know, I, I appreciate where I go, where I'm able to travel to. And as I said, it definitely makes you think through things very carefully. You know, you, you do definitely consider your travel options and where you want to spend that money. Because when you win a bucket of money, obviously I've got to pay for consumables in the lab. I've got to pay for laboratory equipment. I might need to pay for IT equipment. So laptops, pieces of software and to pay for travel as well. And so you're kind of as a lecturer balancing all of those things and then working out which is the best way to spend the money. And sometimes the best way is to go to a particular meeting. And sometimes it's actually not to attend necessarily every event, but put the money towards a particular piece of equipment that facilitates you doing the research. And I've been talking about this really from the point of view of a UK lecturer. Um, and of course, there's, there's different routes. So in one of my earlier videos, um, I'll put a link up to it. I discussed the different ways that you can enter academia. And I discussed the fact that you can come in as a lecturer, but also as a research fellow or as a teaching fellow. And actually those routes as well have different ways of being financed. So the research fellow in particular, um, usually a research fellow position is going to be linked to a research grant or to you know, a big win of money from a research council to help pay for that postdoctoral position. Um, and once you're a research fellow, there's various funds of money you can apply to in order to support your travel and your ongoing research as well. So yeah, it's a little bit like a jigsaw puzzle. You sort of end up piecing money together. So I found that when I worked in industry, I had a budget for my team. And then I used to kind of finance the different options that we were going to do that year, work out what the customer needed us to do for the different projects, and then allocate the money. Um, but the company was always covering the salary of the team members. So I was more dealing with financing the kind of the equipment, the consumables, the travel budgets, um, and also making sure I had some money for the personal development of the team members that I was responsible for looking after. And then when I came across to academia, it's a little bit different in the sense that my salary is being paid as a lecturer, but then I need to make sure that I'm looking at getting money to be able to finance students, to be able to finance postdoctoral researchers, to be able to finance equipment and to be able to finance travel. And yes, there are routes where I can do that through the university. So the university, I can apply to them for central pots of money to pay for like a PhD student's bench fees or a PhD student stipend or to support travel to a conference. Um, but the majority of the time you're looking to win pots of money through these research grants in order to facilitate your ongoing research. And the winning of research grants can be quite challenging. So you can be competing against, you know, several other researchers um, all going for the same bucket of money. Um, but in next week's video, I will chat a little bit about my experiences of going for research grants and some of the things that I've learned over the last few years at the university to how to 
um, improve your chances of being able to sustain your research portfolio as you're growing it as an academic lecturer, which is definitely what I'm doing at the moment. You know, I had my academic industrial re research portfolio when I worked at the company, and then now I've transferred over into academia, and I'm now growing my research portfolio in academia. And as I said, the financing is a little bit different of how we do that. But I guess the take home message is um, lectures do get paid. Um, you'll see there'll be some differences in contracts based on which country you're working as a lecturer. Um, so you'll see tenure mentioned a lot. Tenure has different meanings. I mean, it's a video in its own right. Um, in the UK, most new lectures are going to come in on a probationary period. Um, and at the end of that period, you're going to get a, a kind of a full term contract. And that contract will usually have the usual breakout clauses like you'd expect to see in any other kind of business contract between yourself and your employer. Um, but yeah, um, I hope that wasn't boring. I hope that was vaguely interesting. A little bit of an exploration about the finances. Um, it's one of those subjects that I think sometimes we don't necessarily chat that much about. We're kind of talking about the research, the exciting discoveries we've made, things that we've been up to in the lab. Um, but behind all of that, obviously, we do need to be able to finance it. Um, and again, I think that's quite important as an academic, because sometimes, you know, you have to be quite aware that you might be winning money from a research council. And that research council might be funded actually by the general public, by the, the UK taxpayer. And I think that's a strong push, if anything, to make sure that you're engaging and sharing your research with a wide community, um, because it kind of, I guess you owe it back to them in some kind of way that they're they're helping finance your work and therefore it's important to share what, what you're discovering, what you're finding out, what you're learning. But anyway, that's the kind of the finance side of it. Um, and next week, as I said, we'll have a little bit more of a chat about research grant stuff and some stuff about vlogs. Um, I'm aware that you're coming, hopefully, if you're a student to the end of your exam period now. I know that some exam marks are being released to people. So I hope things are going OK. Um, I hope you are finding things all right. It's probably quite a strange way to end the term, not actually saying goodbye to your, your kind of colleagues and your, your student friends and your teachers and academics. Um, but I hope you're keeping well and keeping safe. If you're waiting for your A-level results to come up in August, as I said before, try not to overthink it. You know, you've done everything you can. It's a very odd year this year. It's a very strange year, but you can't do anything more about it. So try to have a few good weeks of the summer and I'll see you next week for another video about all things university. And if this finance video wasn't too dull or too boring, hit the like button and feel free to hit subscribe. And as always, if you have anything you want to know about university or stuff that goes on as a lecturer, do know to put it in the comments and I'll make sure I check them out and see if we can include it in a future video. But yeah, have a fun few days and I will see you after the weekend. Bye.